Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Historic Preservation Commission regular meeting on Thursday, February 29th. Jim, will you take roll, please? Yes. Lauren Flick. I'm here. Chris Jenkins. Present. Lester LeBeau. Here. Mike Madone. Here. Rich Ballard. He's trying. I believe he said he would have to be absent today. Uh, Jim Nelson here. Do it. Millie Wentz here. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes of the last regular meeting on January 24th? And if so, do they have any changes or modifications they would like to add? I move that we approve the minutes as presented. Second. Jim. Lauren Flick. Approved. Chris Jenkins. Yes. Lester Lamone. Yes. Mike Madone. Yes. Rich Millard. Uh, absent. Jim Nelson. Yes. Millie Wentz. Yes. And the special committee meeting. Yes. So the next item on our agenda uh, is to... Uh, the special meeting minutes, do we need to do something separate on that uh, that we had on February 19th, uh, where we discussed uh, the new method laundry building on Main Street? Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from that meeting? And if there's any modifications. I move that we approve the minutes from our special meeting. Second. Roll call, Jim. Lauren Fleck. I'm going to abstain. I wasn't present at that meeting. Chris Jenkins. Yes. Lester Lamone. Yes. Mike Bedone. Yes. Rich Millard. Absent. Uh, Jim Nelson. Yes. Millie Wentz. Yes. So the next item, uh, the purpose of that last uh, special meeting was the discussion on the new method laundry building. Um, and we decided to move today's meeting to from yesterday to, to or tomorrow, <laughs> Wednesday to Thursday uh, to discuss this. I believe the bids came in. Uh, Leo, is that correct? Uh, came in this morning. Is that correct? Yes, we received bids at 11 o'clock this morning. And you've had a chance to review those. Anything you would like to share with us today? Uh, we've had a chance to download them and kind of look at the preliminary numbers. There are a lot of details and a lot of exceptions and notes in a lot of the bids, just based on the variability of the project and a lot of the unknowns that are out there. We did receive four bids for the project. The uh, low bid, just by as read results only, was from Avalanche Excavating in the amount of $559,500. Um, from there, we had bids from Impact Industrial at $699,493. Earth Services and Abatement at $749,999. And our last bid came from D2 Dirt and Demo at $883,740. All exceeded the... Uh amount the city had allocated is that correct i believe so but i'd have to confirm with rick i believe the city had remaining around four hundred thousand dollars of our epa grant dollars um I'm re i've received an invoice from stantec for additional for the asbestos abatement as well so we're down below four hundred thousand dollars right now available so yeah we are 160 plus thousand short of the cost of demolition of the low bid and if we went with that without any of the changes or change orders that might be incurred so where does that process go from here we have to talk about that internally and figure out if we can come up with the additional funding somewhere i'm sending the information off to the epa i'm also sending it i've sent it to the epa i'm also sending it off to cdphe to see if there might be additional assessment dollars available there to help. Otherwise, um, I have no other budget authority to determine at this point. So we're going to have to talk about it internally. And I was in meetings this morning and we, have, we haven't had that internal conversation yet. 
So just to bring everyone up to date, the reason for our discussion in the special meeting uh, on the 19th was to discuss uh, the possibility of removing the stucco facade on the front of that building and at least assessing what is behind it and to determine if we as a Commission uh, would be in favor of saving that if it looked like it was something worth saving. Uh, I think that um, our observations and what was brought out in that meeting was that it could be removed potentially for a nominal amount. Um, still a lot of information that uh, uh, that needs to be garnered on this issue, but I think as a commission, we wanted to know what was behind it and and we can't make a decision without knowing and had we known that the stucco facade uh, was not attached directly to that cut stone i think we would have had this discussion earlier but now that we know that i think that uh, my impression of the uh, information that we gathered and the feedback that i received uh, at that meeting was that we would like to proceed with removing that facade uh, as a first step uh, to see if there's anything behind it worth saving. Uh, was that everybody else's impression of the meeting? I'd, I'd say to see if, if it's worth saving and at a minimum having a chance to document it if it does have to come down in the end. Um, just a little thought that I had since that meeting and uh, and it kind of came across with some information that I saw the other day was um, and Lauren I wanted to thank you for even bringing that up to me because I I as a home builder and, and being in the building industry can pretty much see if something looks like it's going to be more work than it's worth and certainly the cost is the biggest factor and, and it's not uh, I think our commission's uh, mission to delay projects but uh, I think in terms of like the old Sarah Opera House uh, that stood on Main Street, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. It's a vacant parking lot right in the middle of the block, right across the catacorner corner from the new uh, St. Cloud. And uh, that building was, from my understanding, it was in really bad shape. I was original, the very first opera house in Canyon City. And that historic picture that you see, I think, in the lobby of Wells Fargo shows Main Street in the 1920s. And that building was converted from an opera house to the Canyon Theater. That's a really unique architecture on it. Uh, later, it was converted to a bowling alley. And then in uh, September, or late September, a uh, 30-inch snowfall hit Canyon and the roof collapsed. And the building sat vacant uh, with a collapsed roof uh, till 1967, I believe, is when they finally tore it down. And here we are 50 years later, 40 years later, and it's a, still a vacant lot. Um, I don't think a vacant lot added to the, you know, the uh, historic feel of downtown Canyon City, but... Uh, if the building's going to fall down, it's going to fall down no matter what amount of money you throw at it. So uh, I would like, if possible, to see it. I mean, I can't make a known position as to how to go about that. But personally, I think we need to have more information before I, as a member of this commission, and I'm not going to speak for anybody else, would like to see that before we make a final decision on demolition. Um, what is the thought of the rest of the commission? Um, do the bids include demolition of that front masonry wall? Yeah, the bids as presented include demolition of the front wall. So there's no historic aspect to it. It's just tear it down and throw it away kind of the work for the front. Yes, correct. We did include um, the language that was in the memorandum of understanding between SHPO and EPA in terms of historic preservation and treatment of the shared walls, but nothing for the front wall. Okay.
Well, Chris, to add to your statement, I guess I would, I think it'd be worth some effort to find out what's there and document it. And is that what you were leaning towards? I, I think so. And I think, uh, is that a possibility of, of putting out a bit of just removing that stucco facade uh, to see what's behind it? Uh, um, with this money, likely not as the assessment money, because that's not a contributing building. The facade was not considered part of the historic downtown, the historic district. Um, so EPA is likely not going to. And what is the position it. of the city? Would the city entertain? That's um, not my position to say. Right. I don't know. Well, frankly, I'm not comfortable making a decision when I don't have all the information for that decision. And being as that wall's right in the middle of a block, if you knock that out, you're going to have big empty snaggle to it and break it up. And if we go into any further um, examination of a historic district, that's going to be a force to be reckoned with, that hole in the middle of the... And I think that... Uh... And correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry, Ryan. Did you have something you'd no. like to add? Go ahead. I, I was going to correct come me back I... to the city question when you're done. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Fremont County National Bank was not a part of the historic district. It's within the boundaries of the historic district. However, when it was surveyed, it was listed as a non-contributing building because with the, the facade that was on it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's listed as an intrusion. Yes, or I, I forget the exact wording, but yeah. And I think that would change should the survey be updated. Correct, okay. more than likely. Ryan, you were going to mention something about possibly uh, the city's position on and looking at that. Yeah. So as Rick mentioned, you know the EPA funds are for assessment of the of the building and and. Part of that assessment is the demolition. Uh, we don't we don't have anything budgeted to actually you know do the work that the commission is asking for. We we could get bids and see what it would cost, um, but the likelihood that we would ever be able to save the facade, we don't have the funds for that. The the funding that we have is for the demolition and assessment of the site, and I would impress upon the commission that. Um, you know, we, we could potentially, I mean, if even if we had the funds, you're potentially saving a, a site, at, you know, that could be potentially be at the detriment of a building that is contributing. And, you know, that that is our concern. And with the timelines that we have and, you know, potential for future rainfall and the damage that it could cause to the to the neighboring buildings, um, you know, we'd very much like for that to be a consideration of the of the commission tonight. Let's um, separate a couple of things, I think, in this discussion, because I think there are two pieces here that are getting interwoven, and I think at the one at the detriment of another. When we met for work session, we talked a lot. We talked a lot. Leo, Leo was gracious enough to attend that meeting with us, and and um, we appreciate his input and, and presence there. So thank you for that. Um, but I think there's two goals. Uh, the The least of the two goals in terms of effort is a documentation of what's there. And I don't want that point to get lost in this idea that we're trying to save the facade itself with nothing behind it. If that's something that, that we want to explore, then that's perfectly okay. But that's like agenda item number two. I think agenda item number one is um, the least costly and the least obtrusive in terms of effort, and that is, is there any way that that this comp this commission can not compel, but certainly um, strongly urge this process that the city is undergoing to, in some way, strip that front of its. And we keep using the word facade. And to me, as an architect, the facade is everything from the interior to the exterior. And that's, that's everything. But what we're talking about is the finish, the exterior existing finish of that facade, which is stucco. So I think, and this is my opinion and not the, the commission's opinion necessarily. So I'm speaking for myself as a member. 
to say that that's that's our first step. That's that's what we would that we would strongly urge the the actors in this project to consider, and uh, and especially if there's a way uh, now that there's either some negotiation that has to be um, wrangled with the bids that came in. Uh, if we've got time now to consider something different, but we're, I think our first step is really about, about stripping the finish off the existing historic facade, if for no other reason than to document that building. Um, yes, we all in this room understand that it's not a contributing building. Yes, in this room, we all understand that it's not inside our historic district. Um, but again, it's, it's our self-determination, right? It's this city's ability to say what's important. Um, not that we're placing undue importance on this one thing, but it's always when we're ready to have the tooth pulled that we wish we had a healthy tooth, right? So I think that's, I don't want that to get lost in this discussion or about, about saving things. At, at, at the very least, I think we're talking about documenting. And having the opportunity to do that, even the shortest of opportunities, not not archaeological measured drawings as much as stripping finish and photographing what's there and documenting what's there before it all goes away, right? If there's something beyond that that we can do that somebody suddenly rushes forth with a checkbook, then yeah, let's have a broader discussion. But I think that's I think it's important not to lose not to lose fact that that's what we're trying to do. And as, as I stated, I, I think we can get quotes and see what it would cost to to remove the finish and and see what's behind there. Um, can't commit that we will move forward with the quotes, but we can get quotes and see how much it will cost. How much would that delay the process, uh, or would it? I mean, I think that there's a way of doing this without delaying other items to move forward. Um, putting out a bid to, and obviously the city council is the one who's going to have to make that determination whether they want to do that or not. But I think as this commission is indicating is we would like to see what's behind there so we can make a much more educated decision concerning that. And, and to go back to the, to the open parking lot, I mean, the odds of somebody stepping in here after 50 years of not building on that lot, the odds of something ever being built you know, further down uh, away from the more central core of the historic district, I think would be, we would get lucky if somebody walked in and said tomorrow they're going to commit to doing something down the road a few years. So yeah, I'll, I'll let Leo talk to, to the process and delay. I, I think um, I'll make a couple statements first. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we, what we'd probably do is get quotes before we put it out to bid and, and get a ballpark idea of, of where, what we're talking about and then determine if if we, we'd put it out to bid from there. Um, you know, as far as the, the parking lots and the two comparisons, you know, one's owned by a private individual who uses it for parking for their business versus this lot being uh, it will be publicly owned and can be marketed uh, for future developments. And, and I do think that there's a big distinction between the two. Uh, so there, there could be potential in the future for for seeing it redeveloped and and filling that gap in the smile. Okay. And part of Shippo's request in all of this is that we market the property once we get cleared of the contamination. So we've already agreed to market the property for development that would be consistent with the historic district. I think the the process in terms of the demolition contract is going to be more held up by the city finding the funds to do it and being able to close the gap between what we have budgeted and what we have available. So that definitely allows time for other quotes to come into play. We can certainly even reach out to um, some of the bidders that bid on the demolition contract and get their thoughts on it since they've already intimately looked at the building and could probably be the best ones to give us a number of what just the stripping of the stucco on the facade would look like. Do we need to put anything in a motion? And if we do. Oh, I've got a few more questions. Okay. Uh, looking ahead to, uh, if you were due to do the demolition that clears the site then to be remediated, that's, and in general, is that just excavating down a certain depth, removing some contaminated soil and refilling it in broad strokes? 
Yeah, the demolition wouldn't remove anything below the concrete floor. Oh, so it would just remove down to the concrete floor. With no, no, we're not allowed to touch the soil until the uh, characterization of the site is completed. Okay, so I was looking ahead to step two. Let's say you did demolish the building, um, and now we have a bare lot there waiting for remediation. Uh, what does that remediate remediation probably look like? Is it just excavating through this, taking the slab out and some soil under it? It it depends on what they find. Um, they're going to be doing, and once the building is gone, the EPA will be funding additional assessment that's going to be drilling more monitoring wells to determine the extent of the contamination, the source of it, and the extent of it. And if they find that it needs to be dug out, then they will, we will have to then get additional funding for cleanup, but that will be removing all of the soil that's down there and sending it off to a dump that will take it. If it's not as bad as we hope it is, or that bad, if it's not as bad that it could be, I guess we'll put it that way. Uh, they could, they've got a couple of different options. They could just cap it with blacktop and turn it into a parking lot and keep it that way and watch it and and monitor the natural attenuation. In that case, they would probably put monitoring wells in the parking lot. They probably will anyway. Um, or they can do something that's called in situ, which is to put. Um, material into the contamination to basically solidify it. But that's each of those processes depends on the, the extent of the contamination. Uh, the contamination that's out under Main Street, they're happy with just monitored attenuation, just watching it go because the contamination levels are low. They just don't know what's under the building. So it really depends. We can't say exactly. We don't know exactly where the source is. We we don't know how to what extent there is underneath that soil until we get the building gone. So okay, I guess one of my first of that question was: Are we going to wind up tearing down that front masonry wall of the building anyway to excavate the soil under it? But we don't know that yet. We don't know that. Well, we don't know that, but we also don't know how they're going to get the machinery out of the building either. You know, there's machinery in it that has to come out. We're trying to request that all demolition happen through the back. But there are also low power lines in the back in the alley and getting the machinery out of there, plus getting the drill rigs in to drill after the building is gone may be a significant challenge to do that. The EPA has the ability to bring in drill rigs that can collapse and go in there, but those are considerably more expensive and in demand, which can drag out the process. It, the, the funding they're using is called targeted brownfield assessment funding, but it's it's basically the contractors they use are Superfund contractors, and they are in demand, and they're very busy in other parts of the country, even possibly here, um, but typically they're in other parts of the country, so you're at the mercy of their schedule, which is could take forever, but um, that's who they use. And that's somewhat of a complication, but we don't know yet really whether they can take the machinery apart and pull it out the back, or if they have to pull it out the front, can they get the drill rigs in there? We don't even know the answer to those questions yet. So the, de the, the uh, bid you have for demolition did not include removing machinery out of the building. It did include oh, everything, okay. everything in there. So on yeah. the apparent low bidder, how are they going to get that machinery out of the building? We haven't had a chance to talk with them yet and kind of understand their process. All we've got is their numbers right now. Okay. Yeah. I have a structural question. I think we brought this before. So when we talk about removing the slab, we're talking about the basement floor. The so floor. That, that basement extends. We didn't know if that extended all the way up to the front. That. So yet, to be, yet to be or, determined or goes all the way to the very back of the alley does yeah, it I don't, extend all the way back i don't think it does but we don't really as far know. as we've been able to tell the only part that isn't a slab on grade is the very front part mm -hmm. of the westernmost building is raised about a foot or two above and has a wood floor that you can see through it doesn't appear to be a full basement it appears to just be a crawl space for the little bit we can see um, but the rest of it all appeared to just be a slab on grade with no basement. So they'll have to bring in fill of some sort in order to ramp down to that level, or they're going to backfill up to ground. You can't have a parking lot, obviously, unless they well, bring it. They yeah, have to bring to, in fill. The bid includes backfilling um, to match the alley importing, in the back and the sidewalk in the front. Importing fill. Yes. What clean, clean road base material, I believe, is what we required for it.
Any other questions? Anyone like to entertain a motion or do we want any kind of formal action today? Well, I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'm just wondering what kind of action we think we want to produce. If there's any action, are we just trying to make a statement uh, about our, uh, as a unified commission? Is that what we are trying to do? Or I think is it, is it ask just this to get some preliminary bids? put together or get a price, get an idea of cost. If I can add one more, we do have somebody from the public who'd like to speak about this. He's sure. the building of the contributing owner on the east side, Kevin Camerlo. Hello, Kevin. How are you today? Good, Chris. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of concerns about the new method I have for years. It was uh, in a declining state for the 43 years I've been downtown. Uh, I would call it a dire situation now on uh, the potential for collapse there. I actually have to pump the water out of that building collected in tanks. Uh, the roof leaks so bad. We're trying to keep our common wall dry. And uh, it's a very hard process when uh, uh, that roof's leaking like that. But I took it on my, upon myself to try to keep our masonry wall dry. Uh, we're seeing a lot of bowing in that particular wall. Uh, the beams in the uh, new method laundry are obviously sagging. Some have sagged as much as two foot. Uh, a lot of the leaking is now moving with the sagging of the roof. Most of the leaks now have gone to the, the center of the new method laundry roof system. So there's a two two story roof system and then the, the one story roof system. Uh, about three years ago in February, they uh, let a two inch water main freeze which uh, significantly damaged that common wall on the eastern side. Uh, I believe it's affected the common wall on the western side too, both that event and uh, and just the leaks over time. So I'd like to impress upon this commission that this has to be a very speedy process. I believe it's going to collapse probably during a spring, heavy spring snow. I've seen at least two foot sag in the back under the main beam, which is basically five two by 12s joined together, carrying the main, main roof system in the back. So if I can impress it upon you to speed the plow on this, I think you should, because the situation I see is it's gonna, if there is a collapse there, it's going to apply lateral forces to our wall and probably the other wall. I don't, I see it taking out not just one common wall, but possibly two, the way that building's constructed. That, that common wall is approximately 22 to 24 foot high. It's a triple brick masonry. So there's quite a bit of weight. Once that weight moves, who knows what it's gonna do. The bearing structure on my side, they're about 20 foot wide. So when a 24 foot wall collapses, it's probably gonna affect the next spring unit over to the, to the east. And so I've kept those two uh, commercial space is vacant for three years now because of the fear of collapse. I won't put anybody in there. I've had a lot of uh, people who wanted to rent those spaces, but it's been, uh, it's been trying. It's a trying, trying process. So anything you can do to, to help uh, speed this along would be much appreciated. Um, I appreciate the city taking on this, uh, this enormous uh, task because nobody else would have and it would lead to collapse. So hopefully we don't have that because I think if you do, our building's on the National Historic Register and it's going to significantly damage our building when that comes down. Then what do we do? I think you're gonna have a big hole in Main Street if something doesn't happen soon. You're welcome to come by <laughs> my building, take a look at it. Uh, I think if you look at it from my side, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty scary. I don't know if, Leo, do you feel there's a chance of that collapsing? I the building the new method collapse yes yeah. yeah that's in very poor shape I can speak to there's several main roof beams in the back that are totally rotted through and already sagging off their supports um, the hole in the wall from the water leak is very evident um, the western shared wall at least the front portion of it appears to be all made out of adobe block so that's you know that's ripe for erosion and failure should water intrusion really start to happen there. It's it's not a good building, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess the, the big fear is just 
if it does collapse, I, I believe there's going to be a lot of damage to to both my building and the, the building to the west. So, let me ask you, Kevin, what your thoughts are on that front facade. If if you know, looking I, I at believe, that, I believe in pre preserving history if we can, but uh, it seems to me like we have a choice. We if if, if we can uh, get this job done and preserve the the buildings on each side of that building, that that may be the best we can do. I think the the facade is cool. It would be a uh, it would be a, uh, a benefit to the downtown and the downtown look and the historic look. But so if we can take a look at that without delaying the project, would you be opposed to that? As long as it doesn't delay the project, I'd say yes. But the, it looks like the project's in somewhat trouble. I mean, we don't we don't have enough money to yet for the for the for the low bid. Now we're adding another aspect to it so i guess it i just don't know like it's going to delay the project yeah and that's what we don't want to do i think that's been our consensus all along is if we delay it and cause any additional uh, and i'm thank you very much for joining us because i gave us you know a much even more in-depth uh view of what we're dealing with and um what yeah, is yeah I, I encourage you to go look at that wall i, I, I mean it's, it's not it's not a comfortable feeling actually being in either of those spaces okay I think I will. So, uh, right, Rick, Rick's been down there. Were you comfortable in there, Rick? Many times, no, <laughs> no. So, anyway, okay. that's uh, that's my uh, perspective. I'd be happy to answer any more questions or give you my contact information if you'd like to come down. And I, I'd work. like to get that before you leave, or if you could leave it, yeah, I'll leave taking it. off. Any other questions? I'd I'd like to get that contact information as well. You bet. Take a look. Thank you um, for your time. I have oh, a question on the uh, what the scope of work in the present bid. So there's a, a bad wall on the east side of New Method Laundry space. Is that, that's the wall that you share? Yes, on the eastern side. It's about 60 foot long, two okay. stories high. Did the bid documents include any work to strengthen that wall? It does include repairs to that wall. And then whatever treatments are necessary to make those shared walls rated for exterior, I believe... They're not fired bricks. I'm not a mason. I don't I know bricks that well, but the bricks like that are there are not fired and wouldn't be rated for exterior. So we would need some kind of treatment on each of those walls to make them accessible or, you know, be able to hold up to exterior weather and moisture. So you've got a multi-wythe wall you'd be repairing part of. Are you just taking off the first layer or wythe of brick or what does that scope typically look like on that shared wall with him? My impression when we issued the bid was prior to any of the MOAs with SHPO was just to repair the brick and put a new coating on the wall. Um, but I think the the memorandum of understanding requires some historic treatments on that wall. So some of that it still has to be determined based on what we see when we can expose those shared walls and get a good assessment of what damage is there after the building is done. But if there's a bow in the wall, the bid documents don't include anything to address the, the the engine well the right. bids required them to hire an engineer to take a look at it to to determine the best course of action and they are also required to talk to the neighboring property owners to see their buildings as well to understand the entire scope of the wall damage whether it's Kevin's side or Brad's side um, we had we had the bid the RFP didn't specify that there was a bow in the wall but the engineering any structural engineer who was in there should be taking a look. And we also had a study done two years ago uh, by Three Rocks Structural Engineering who specified some of that information. So that information went out with the RFP for it. Okay. I, I was just wondering how certain they are about what they're getting into and how much money they put into their bid to address structural problems on that wall. That typically they escalate when you start tearing into them. Mm -hmm. Kevin, is there a basement under your building adjacent to it? There's not a basement under the adjacent part, but you go down two storefronts, basically 40 feet, and then the three-story part of the building has a full basement. So we're, uh, we have slab on grade on part of that uh, storefront, and part of it is uh, uh, joists on a, on a very small crawl space. Uh, the foundation, uh, Original foundation work, in my opinion, uh, wasn't very impressive on that part of the building. It must have been added later. Uh, wasn't built with the uh, 1874 three-story brick part of that building, which actually has, a, uh, I think, a pretty good foundation because they dug down to uh, basically the gravel bed. 
they've had problems in that area where they built uh, built buildings on that uh, alluvial uh, clay cap. Uh, one was the county, the old county administration building had collapsed over there, which was a, only about a block away. Block away, yeah. So, uh, so those foundations, I, I don't think they would design them that way anymore. So it's going to be a tough fix. I mean, you, you have a fairly thin foundation on a, on a clay cap with a three course brick wall that bears in both directions. It bears the new method from east to west, and then it bears our floor joists and roof joists from east to west also. So it's going to, it's going to be a tough job, I would say. I mean, I've been in construction my good part of my life and uh, it's going to be challenging and, and costly, I imagine. So then essentially it's a three-story brick. Once you get down to the basement level, there's three stories of that. There's no basement level on, on, on yours, but obviously on the new method building that that base, that wall. Adjacent. No, I, I don't believe on that side of the building, the, the basement exists. It's only on the Western side. Is that right, Leo? Oh, I see. Yeah, just the, the only part I've seen that has any kind of basement crawl space is the very Western side of the building. Right and it's the only entrance. the front third of the building that seems like it yeah right below the entrance of the building seems to be where it is and the contamination is it focused in the basement area is it we suspect no we suspect it's underneath the dry cleaning machine which is about half the way back on the west side as you walk in the building the dry cleaning machine is right back in the middle of the building right there we suspect it's in there because there's a trough behind it as well, where they we suspect they just dumped the chemicals for years. Um, maybe not recently, but it was common practice years ago to just dump the chemicals in the ground. Um, so we suspect it was done in there. And there's another a drain right by the original west wall of the eastern portion of the building, I guess you could say. There's a drain on the west side of that that we suspect was used for just draining chemicals into the ground. So we think the contamination will be back there, not necessarily the basement portion of it, but behind it. But you don't know for sure. So obviously, not I guess I go back to gone. the basement because obviously if we excavate the slab of that basement, the adjoining building is even more affected by the lack. That, that would affect that western building yeah which has the i guess the fit 101 in it now and uh, that is an adobe wall as far as i can tell at least mm -hmm. the the maybe the first two-thirds street side of that building yeah it is so that's going to be a challenge for the work no matter what obviously that's the risk of this project and probably why the bids are coming in the way they are why they why they told us that we could expect sticker shock when they looked at the building there's just there's question marks throughout the whole demo project. So you know we, we I've been working on this now for th three years. Um, when we looked at it initially, uh, we looked at it initially because Kevin and Brad, the two owners of the adjacent buildings, both called the city and said, "You got to take a look at this." Um, and we went in thinking, how can we use it best? You know, what's the best use of the building? How can we market the building? Once we walked in, we just wish we had hard hats on and realized that we have a serious problem here. Serious problem. And it was operating like that. Um, so the sense of urgency that I have is it's like, it's always the next snowfall. Always the next snowfall is going to bring it down. Because it's, it's in really, really rough shape. Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't know that um, I don't know that I'm necessarily in favor of, of looking for another uh, bid proposal based on based on the conversation we've had, but I am interested in including whatever instructions you give to your low bidders, the opportunity to to strip that finish first or to strip that finish in and in, in give us a day or two uh, as part of their contract. I'm not looking for additional work. I'm looking for work they're going to do already. Um, but one would think that that's pennies on the bid dollar to strip that stucco so that at least it can be documented. We don't certainly don't want to add to the schedule. Um, certainly don't want to add to the, um, in my opinion, 
don't want to add to the uh, cost. Um, those are obviously driving all of this, but we would like some consideration. That's what we're asking, I think, or at least in my opinion, that's what we would ask. Any other input? Sketchy. <laughs> Uh, I, I can keep asking questions. So you're 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 over budget significantly. Um, it doesn't sound like anything's going to happen very soon. And trying to either get that price down or find additional funding that's going to take some time on the city's part. Well, me. unless there's money that can be shifted, but I don't have the answer to that. Okay, yeah. uh, it seems like we have. I would think a little time to continue to discuss this and think about it as a commission. Uh, I don't see that. We're slowing anything down by asking these questions or wanting to find out what to do with that wall other than to demolish it. Um, we can we can negotiate a change. We can request if we can even come up with the money to do it. We can request that they take the, the scrape off the stucco and see what it looks like. We'd, I'm sure there would be a change of some sort, but um, can like Ryan said before, we can we can. We can kind of get the bid and see where it is, see what they say. Um, we really, as Leo said, we don't know yet what their thinking was. You know, how are they going to proceed with it to support the cost that they're saying this is going to take, you know? Um, but we can we can ask, we can negotiate. Would it be an idea to have someone from the commission involved with those discussions with a, a parent low bidder? We were we were planning on having Mike Madone part of that. Good. And I think he's still going to since he hasn't bid. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But yeah, the consideration for SHPO was that historic preservation assists in determining whether the walls, the shared wall, is treated correctly for historic consideration. And with Mike as a Mason, I think he's adds a lot of knowledge in how to shore it up anyway, you know, preserve the, the, the brick anyway on both sides. So I'm ha happy to have him part of it. So I think that's all we're asking is for maybe, I, I don't know that we want to include it in that same bid. Is that, or if we want to at least see what the cost is to do just even a partial removal of that sucker facade so long as it doesn't delay the rest of the project and i think that would be our stipulation is that we keep moving forward i think kevin impressed on us the situation with his adjoining properties and we and we don't want to delay that certainly so uh, if there's a way to do both i think that if we have time uh i think we would ask the city at least to look into uh, giving us the opportunity to see what that facade is uh, looks like and if we make any other decisions after that point we do it at that point so we want a motion or we just want to make a consensus of the of the commission or any other thoughts what what's the minimum that we think we would want in the way of documenting what's there do you want to see all of the stone take all the stucco off I think if we remove enough of it to tell if it's in decent shape, we can decide if it has to be the entire thing. But I think it's going to be a bid for removing the entire false front. Again, let me let me go back to just making sure that when we talk about this, we're talking about documenting versus saving. So in a documentation, to answer your question from a documentation, I would actually yield to Lisa's um uh, knowledge on how how Shippo, I guess, would document a front facade in terms of a review for contributing status or for um, district status. And that's what we would want to do is to make sure we met that criteria so that we would be meeting other criteria for future uh, district status for the Main Street. Since we think that there might be two different uh, facades back behind, probably the more the better is removed for documentation purposes. Uh, so we could see the original, uh, definitely the second, good chunk of the second floor, uh, the stucco being removed. Uh, yeah, 
that would that would be my recommendation. And you're For saying the, the, the entire extent of that masonry wall from left Good. to right would be removed. Yeah. Okay, on the second floor at least. Yes. Lisa, there's something in this chat. Can you happen to know what that is? Is that Rich trying to? That I do not know. Are you with Rich? us, Rich? And is I'm going to have to have a call soon, but I'm with you. I guess we don't have a good connection, Rich. He's, he's going to be taking off somewhere right there. Oh, I see. I'm going to be taking off soon. I will need to leave the Zoom, but I'm in agreement with consensus of documentation after removal of stucco. Okay. And just to explore that a bit more, further, Mike, you saw the back of the backer board that looks like it's on the outside of the stone. And your thought is that someone applied a stucco finish over that backer board. Right. And so you've probably done this many times as far as demolition. Getting that that board off that stone shouldn't be a big challenge, right? It it, it really shouldn't. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things you really don't know until yeah. you start digging into it. But um, some projects I've been in, involved with, uh, peeling off a, a facade, we we did the Sherwin Williams building, um, and in that I, it it came off fairly easily. Um, once you kind of figured out how it was adhered, um, is your thought that there is a lath on the outside of that board, or is it just a direct applied stucco over the board? I, I'm I'm sure they would have put some lath up. Okay. And somehow that's all been screwed back to the stone to be there all these years, right? Right. What what I saw is there's uh, some, I don't know if they're two by sixes or two by fours along the bottom. You can see on the face um, where the stucco at the second level, it actually angles out and then goes up. Um, and right at that level, they put some sort of two by structure okay. and then have some verticals in between with some on the top. I'm just sitting there thinking you probably erect a scaffold and, and tear that thing off fairly simply. And dispose of it, right? I I I think it would be fairly simple, but it, it's it's you one of those things you understand. You, you don't know until you start tearing into it, and that's where where bids get get high just from not not being aware. Um, it, in in that meeting with the the contractor, I I want to be clear of how it's constructed and and try to convince them that this is an easy possibility. I I would think. I, you know, I, I don't do demolition, but if, if I was tearing down that building, I would want to take off the stucco, at least on either side where it connects to the two other buildings. So, you know, how that connection is made. And that's, that's where you would have to be delicate removing. So you're not tearing that building down with it. Um, that may be something that's in their plan already to at least cut a section off on either side to see how how those buildings are connected. And do you think these bids anticipated stripping the stucco off before they tore the stone down or are they just going to blow the whole wall down at once? I I, I think most of it would be just grabbing That's their tobacco there... job. But I, I I would think where it connects to the building, where you know what you're supposed to shore up and yeah. save, even where floor joists are tying in, that's that's where they got to be delicate. Um and and make sure it's loose before they come in with their wrecking ball or however they or you'll take kevin's building down at the same time right yeah. that's yeah. why it had to be engineered first mm -hmm. we we required them to hire an engineer to okay. engine design the demolition basically rick did you say somebody is going to take the signs or is there an arrangement that's made or there's there hasn't been any arrangements i've had a couple of people ask for them yeah. one was the previous owner's family um, they're interested in them. So that shouldn't cost anything. It's hopefully not. It's a matter of whether the city will allow people to just take it down because of liability issues or something like that. You know, that's, that will probably have to be part of the discussion. I don't speak to that. I tend to not think in terms of liability, but there are people in the city who do. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to them to determine. They're at a higher pay grade. They're, yeah, <laughs> apparently, yeah. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? Um, I think we've come to a consensus. I don't think we're going to put it in the form of a motion, but I think we'd like the city at least to investigate the possibility of at least seeing what's behind the facade and certainly uh, moving forward with 
uh, you know, stabilizing uh, the structure and Kevin's structure next door is a priority and that we can rediscuss this uh, at a later date should the uh, additional funding come in sooner. And in the meantime, I think a couple of us would like to uh, take a look at your building, Kevin, and get a close up look at what's happening over there. And if the city will allow us to maybe even walk through new method with the hard hat on, depending on the liability. I don't have a hard hat, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that, is there anyone who wants to make it in the form of a motion or we just want to move forward? Okay, I think that we uh, come to that uh, conclusion and we'll move forward with that then. Anything else? So we took up quite a bit of time on that. We'll move on to the next item, uh, the Saving Places Conference. Um, had several people attend that uh, remotely and uh, in person. So if uh, some of you would like to share what you learned and move forward with that. Were you there, Mike? I, I, I was there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I had the opportunity to attend as a, a, a sponsor. Um, through my business and have a, a table. So uh, there, there were some uh, um, presentations that I, I didn't get to get to. I, I've been trying to catch up on online. Um, but I, my, my biggest takeaway always from uh, that convention is, is uh, just being around this, this large group of, of wonderful people who are passionate about historic preservation um, it's just this wealth of knowledge, um, uh, architects, engineers, other preservation commissions, um, different mun municipalities, um, uh, preservation commission from Wyoming that I worked with on a project was there. Um, the, uh, while there, the, the, um, presentations I, I focused on, uh, one, uh, was with historic core. Um, and they're a nonprofit organization um, uh, that I, I, I want to make a, a bigger connection with. Th this could be something in the future where we run into something like this that we could coordinate with them to where they have volunteers um, that, that do stuff like like this. Um, and they, they, they uh, group up with contractors um, who kind of work as team leads to help train um, uh, people who are passionate about this. And I, I, I it, it, it's kind of exciting looking at it that way, being a contractor. Um, if everyone on my crew is excited, as excited and positive about a, a historic horror crew, they, they, you know, not necessarily as, as skilled, but it, it, it would just be more fun. That's kind, kind of why I got into that type of work is, is um, just the passion that everyone involved has. Um, but they, they talked a lot about um, uh, how, in, in any construction industry, it's hard to find tradespeople. Um, and it's even harder in the historic trades. Um, but they're, it's something that they're trying to grow just like everyone else um, with, with trades. Um, uh, a few things on adaptive reuse. Um, green building is is the new, big new construction thing. And, and uh, I, one of the quotes, I, I wish I had it, um, one of the presentations was the, uh, the the greenest building is the building that is already there that you uh, use for adaptive reuse. You're, you're not, you know, tearing it down and, and which, which isn't the case for, for everything. Um, oh, what else? That, there's so much to take away from uh, the convention. It definitely, definitely. I recommend anyone who can attend virtually or, in person is even better. Um, next year, it's going to be in Colorado Springs, so a lot closer. Did you attend it, Melanie? Yeah, I did it on Zoom. And uh, when you talk about passion, and uh, quite often you'd find yourself on both sides of the issue. And uh, ideas and attitudes were brought up that uh, previously would not have been approached. And uh, there's more inclusion and more diversity of uh, points of view. And uh, we are very conservative in some of our 
approaches to problems than were expressed at that seminar. Um, new voices, new different ways of doing things, but they did have some uh, basic preservation. There was one on finishes of old adobe and masonry uh, walls. Craftsmanship to, was there. So it just wasn't new, new stuff. A lot of the old techniques were being uh, brought forward. But it was so diverse. I've never run into such a wide scope of ideas before. That, that was scary. <laughs> Lester? Well, I know that we're gonna run into time constraints here, so I won't I won't go on other than to say it was a good conference. I enjoyed it. I did did it virtually, had a couple of issues, technical issues that they had uh with the online portion. So boy, if you could uh if you could hang out at his table next year too, that'd be uh, doing it in person, I think would be a great opportunity. So Lisa? Yeah, I was able to attend in person. Uh, one of the major takeaways that I got from it was during the um, one of the keynote addresses that the state of Illinois is looking at relevancy for historic preservation long term and going into the into the future. Uh, what properties reevaluating? the older guidelines uh, for what gets designated and what is um, allowable for properties that have been listed and giving some more flexibility uh, is what they're looking at, um, which was shocking to me. <laughs> um, if you ever get a chance to, uh, I think I emailed out the link to most of you uh, for their what they've done and for the relevancy project. Um, it's a 200 pages, but um, their main mission statement was pretty interesting, if you get a chance. The other um, session I went to was reimagining home, a historic context, and the National Registry of Hist Historic Places. And Vermont has been surveying their mobile home parks as a historic, uh, well, historic residencies. Uh, they're looking at them uh, for a potential designation as a site. In some cases, they are now, uh, some are 50 years old or older, and looking at them in different ways in terms of how they were laid out. Um, some are in grid, some of them look more like uh, neighborhoods and why. Uh, I know we have a lot of mobile home parks in our community, and maybe we should be looking at how long they've been around here as part of our community development. Okay, anything else? Any other takeaways? Oh, there was one, uh, another one. Uh, found out that they were, they had done a survey, History Colorado, of all the listed properties within the state and their connection to underrepresented communities. And they found that was only 3% of all the listed historic properties within the state reflect uh, or are linked to uh, underrepresented community. And so that's one of the reasons why History Colorado is looking at trying to designate more sites within the state that have links to underrepresented communities like African Americans, Native Americans, women, LGBTQ communities. Uh, that's what their goal is for this next couple of years. Any questions? Uh, we'll move right into the uh, public outreach committee, item number six. I'll give it back to you. So our public outreach committee just met uh, prior to this meeting. We discussed um, doing outreach at Senior Mini College 
for the resource day. So we'll have a booth there. And then the other major outreach opportunity will be in May, May 18th, doing a historic windows repair workshop. So that will be from nine to about noon. We'll get more details as it gets closer. And we're bringing in somebody, yes. an expert. Yep, an expert, John Sargent uh, from Deep, Root Constru Deep Roots Construction. Uh, any general announcements today? Uh, no announcement, but if I could add one other suggestion or idea anyway, um, a lot of the topic was about the building itself, but I think it'd be very helpful if SHPO could provide funding to help Kevin with his building on his side of the, of the wall, particular if there's, if our funding can't do that. Um, I, I threw that idea out there to SHPO in the, in the conversations about this project, um, the the email exchanges were not about Kevin's building part in, in necessarily in terms of this project. It was about the demolition. But if Kevin's interested in entertaining it, I think it'd be a good application for funding to assist with shoring up his side of the building at least. You know, if there's any other assistance we can get from SHPO financially, that would be awesome. It would certainly help um, with the structural side of this project. In the long term, I guess, if they were to contrib contribute to the demo side of it, um, it could help pay for, obviously, the demolition and treating the exterior wall to make it, the interior wall to make it an exterior wall. But he also has damage on his side that could be, if it can't be addressed here, it could be useful to have a grant from SHPO to help with that. So that's just a suggestion maybe a different agenda item for another meeting. But I just wanted to throw that out there as a possibility. SHPO does have the ability to help with this as well financially. We just haven't approached them specifically about that. Okay, I think that's a good advice. And I think that uh, if there's any information you can provide with us, Lisa, we'll perhaps forward that to Kevin and anyone else who may need that information to at least approach that for some additional funding. Uh, the other announcement I have is regarding training opportunities for the commission uh, through the CLG portal. The next one that's coming up is March 20th at noon. And it's regarding History Colorado's Colorado Heritage for All. And it aims to talk about the designation of um, 150 prop properties associated with underrepresented communities. You can also get access to their uh, webinars that have been recorded for the last couple of months. There's one uh, on historic context studies through at Fort Collins, and then Denver and context are also available through that CLG portal that you can review on demand. The other thing I wanna mention, we talked about at the last meeting regarding signs. Uh, the next city council meeting, we'll also be talking about that as uh, part of a, a, an agenda item. On what March, day is that meeting? March 6th, I believe. No, I take that back. It's March fourth. You're talking about the joint. Is it the joint meeting? Is it March? It March sixth. Yeah, it's yeah. the March sixth at six yep. p.m. Yep. And that that's that'll be more of a um, discussion. But they, Amy Schmisher was part of a meeting about the signs, and she requested also that you be included in that, since we talked about it in the meeting a um, month ago. Yes. I believe. Okay. Is that everything, Lisa? Uh, anyone in the general public you have any comments or questions or input? 
If not, uh, when is our next meeting? Next meeting is March 27th at 4 p.m. Chris, I have one item before you okay. adjourn. Mm -hmm. We received uh, by email yesterday a draft of the memorandum of agreement between the EPA and History Colorado, and we haven't discussed it at this meeting. Is that something you want to talk about next meeting? Is this the email that you sent to us this past week, Rick? Yesterday? Did I send that to you yesterday? Yes. And yeah. is that something we need to, as a commission, address, or is it uh, something you're looking for some individual it's, input? It's probably more for information. It's just the latest update. It hasn't changed anything other than changing the the 30 day review period to 45, and then it it designates the city as a signer and not a concurrent signer, so that we have some ability to work with commission to request changes to the memorandum. The okay, way it was written, written before, it was yeah. we were not able to make any changes to the memorandum. I had some comments on it. Do we want to do those today and go past five o'clock? I think or we, wait till next time. Yeah, I think that's fine. You want to get into it now? Sure. Okay. Unless everybody, I think it's a good time now. Okay. Well, I'll try to go quickly here. Um, there's a uh, signature on there, a uh, signature block for the Preservation Commission. So we would be, uh, this commission would be a concurring party. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Concurrent means you are being, you are being consulted in the, in the, in this, in anything that has to do with this agreement. Okay. And who, who prepared the draft? EPA. Okay. Has it been reviewed by council for the city or council for the state? Uh, the, the state SHPO, yeah, but the city, no. Okay. Is it going to be reviewed by a? An attorney representing the city. Well, it has been it has been reviewed by an attorney for the city. Yes, okay. it hasn't been reviewed by city council. Okay. Uh, there's a statement on page one of the of the agreement that says the EPA is consulted with this commission. How, has that happened through through emails with Lisa? Yes. Okay. I don't I don't know if the commission considers that to have been a consultation with this commission. I didn't know if we wanted to discuss that or um, whether we view that as an accurate statement. So I'm bringing that up, I guess. I, I highlighted that as well. I, I we've we've been in the loop through the city, but just the way it's worded, the EPA has consulted with the Canyon City Preservation Commission, and I. That that just seemed weird to me as well. So I, I was I was uh, I don't know what we want to do about this as a commission, but it seems like that needs to be edited somehow to more accurately reflect what happened, or have them meet with or us. have them meet with us. I don't, I don't know if they're required to actually uh, consult with us because they, in my opinion, they haven't done that. We can request that. We, yeah, we can request that. Okay. Or, um, or they could word it that the city has consulted with the commission or, you know, I, I guess there's, there's, it's in the hands of SHPO right now, but um, I'm sure we could request that EPA meet with you. I assume that by it. signing this, this commission would say everything in here we agree with. Yeah. Again, you're a consulted party, not a sign or a party, not a negotiating party necessarily. You're a consulted party. We were technically a consulted party as well. We are not in this negotiation either. So what does the signature of the commission mean then if we're just a consulted party? Well, like even the agreement, the agreement says that if, if there's a disagreement, there's this review period. And if the EPA wants to do what the EPA wants to do, it's going to do it. <laughs> so that's, it's, that's one of the comments that our attorney made. It's like, well, you're agreeing that the EPA and the C and, and SHPO are going to have negotiations and if they don't agree there's a review period and they can just do what they want so, i thought it was a very odd contract that way the epa basically can uh, decide to walk out of this contract anytime they want to which i thought was odd i've never seen a con contract like that my and, biggest concern is that we were not included as a signer okay. so we were even a third party looking in at this agreement and it's like no this is this is our downtown. This is the building that the city owns. This is our project. We should be able to make amendment requests to this agreement. So is this still a work in that. progress then to try to get- We it? haven't gotten any signatures from SHPO yet. Oh, so okay. technically, yes. All right. And then just jump into the back there. 
not only do they have the ability to walk away from this agreement anytime they want, they are the sole party that will decide in a dispute who's right. That's what I referred to like before. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just it's it's their money. Us. Yeah. I, I don't know if this commission wants to get into the legalities of things. It seems odd that that would be something we would agree to. Well, what we don't, if we want to use EPA money, we don't have much choice. It's their money. They're considering it their project. And if the money isn't there for whatever reason, even the assessment money that we were talking about before, if that money disappears, it's not available anymore. Okay. So this agreement is sort of a, I guess it's better than nothing, but it, it doesn't seem to have any teeth. They can walk out anytime they want. This and agreement is strictly a procedural thing between the <laughs> EPA and other federal other federal agency okay. impacted by I'm this. I'm sort of stating the obvious yeah. to you, I guess, about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's, I There's a, a party in here on page two called ACHP that isn't defined. Who is that? Um, I've uh, actually sent a note on yeah. that. That's the Advisory Council for uh, Historic Preservation. That's the federal. Yeah, federal. That's the federal. That's the federal side. This is I a just federal confirmed. agency called whatever you just Advisory said. Council yeah. on Historic Preservation. And so the EPA would consult with them on things. EPA technically is consulting with them through state SHPO. They go through the state. The state operates on behalf of the federal government in the, in the case of historic preservation. So the state... Any agreement that the EPA has with the state will then go to review in Washington by the ACHP, um, which is another two-week process okay. there. So yeah, it's very it's really convoluted, honestly. But it's really because federal dollars are being spent in an area that has an impact on another federal agency, which is historic preservation. So we are kind of like a third party in this procedural thing that, okay. It's like, we don't exist in this, you know, <laughs> kind of. All right. Well, I, I, again, I'm probably stating the obvious. Yeah. That's also just some oddity yeah. in here. On the stipulations, item number one, they said the city's put out an RFP to quote unquote, demolish the property. And they don't really define what the property is or what demolish means. I'm, I'm hearing today that we're, we're going to be strengthening the wall of a neighboring property. That is more than demolition. Well, that's defined in there. That's that's one of the one of the agreements that the city makes is that as defined in that MOA is that we will protect the shared wall from collapse. I guess you could say, and we will we will treat the exterior of the wall so that it is or the brick so that it can can be an exterior surface protected that way it doesn't well, the way define they, specifically how it's going to be demo the that's way they phrase that in item number two in stipulations is that we're going to preserve the adjacent structures that, that's pretty vague so does that mean we're going to be strengthening an adjacent property? we have to strengthen the wall before we take okay. it down yeah that's right. why we have the engineering design being done in the demolition and then item three says that they're going to re remediate the plume under the building to standards for residential construction and I was just curious, is that an appropriate level of, of um, remediation for this particular property? I mean, it's, it's the most level. restrictive level. It's more restrictive than a commercial level. Mm -hmm. Okay. The um, agreement has a duration that says the agreement will expire in 15 years, which is sort of an oddity to put in a contract. What's the reasoning behind that? Uh, we don't know how long the contamination will last. You know, when, when C CDPHE was talking about this, they, they initially said you won't be able to do anything with that site ever. Um, EPA doesn't necessarily agree with that, but in order to put a termination date out there, they had to put it out there far enough so that we could make sure that the contamination was gone because the next part of it was that we would market the building for commercial development, which you can't do if it's on contaminated soil. So this so, 15 years is more or less just uh, that's the maximum amount of time they have to actually remediate it to a, an added uh, it's, it, it's a It's a date they put in there considering that probably will be enough time. That's a long ways off. So I thought this would be a rather quick process once demolition and soil sampling was over, they would rather quickly move in and remediate, but that's not the case necessarily. Dry cleaners are very, very difficult. Okay, so this site could be quote unquote, I guess from my 
a one way of looking at it, under construction or a mess for a number of years, right? With could be exploration and yeah, it's, so it, not, it'll be it'll be it won't, I mean it won't be a mess. It'll be it'll be monitored. The contamination will be monitored unless it's completely cleaned. The contamination will be monitored for as long as CDPHE requires those wells to stay there before they abandon them. So at how long in the future would be before you could actually put this property up for sale then? It could be as quickly as two years, could be as quickly as five years, could be 15 years. Oh. We, we really don't know. It's just so really we take down this wall in front, which we're talking about doing, and it could be that we have to leave it bare for 15 we, years. That's, yeah, we might have to. Okay. It really depends. It's At that point, it's under the control of the CDPHE okay. because of the contamination. And that's really what's creating this whole scenario all right is the contamination well chris those were my comments appreciate you diving into that lauren and discussing that any quite rick did you uh have any or not rick uh blank here ryan, <laughs> ryan did you have any? i was gonna say something rick covered it okay thank you ryan any other questions or comments we ran a little long, but uh, if there are none, uh, I adjourn this meeting.